um, what got you so interested in sustainability? I've always been interested in the environment. I'm someone who uh, grew up loving surfing and the outdoors. So I've certainly always had a, a love for nature, but uh, I, I guess intellectually I became interested uh, when I became a local government councillor in South Melbourne and I saw a lot of waste in places like the market. It was at a time when people were encouraging recycling and, and better waste systems. And so I got interested in that as a councillor. And then when I ended up in government, uh, as it had been such a passion of mine, I was really pleased to end up being the Minister for Environment. Wonderful. So that sort of adds a bit to my next question. So, you know, as a former Deputy Premier and the first ever Minister for Climate Change, um, how do you think that in the current environment we can action uh, a productive climate change agenda whilst having a federal government that still has members that don't actually believe in climate change or want to enact sustainability? Well, it is challenging because the federal government has many of the important levers that are needed if we're going to really tackle climate change. Yeah. Having said that, the state governments do have a lot of powers in this area. Uh, they have a large responsibility for the energy system, for transport, for city planning, uh, for agriculture and land use. So states can make a big difference. And they are, I think, in Victoria, we're seeing the government with a very strong renewable energy policy. So they've got a system to uh, encourage new renewable energy and actually um, provide a, a financial support for that. So in Victoria, South Australia, uh, and now more recently in New South Wales, we're seeing strong support for renewable energy. But it would be much better if we had a backing from the federal government as well. Yeah, so it, given that context as well, given the wonderful work that the different state governments are doing, what can we better do to be able to work with, um, you know, different elements of the federal government that may actually be interested in uh, a better sustainable environment? I think that's a really interesting question because within uh, the federal government, there certainly are people who do support more action. And I think part of what we have to do is work with them in areas where we can jointly uh, step forward. So uh, one area would be in agriculture, for example. There are lots of benefits in more sustainable agriculture, not just for the climate, but actually benefits for biodiversity and indeed for farmers and farming themselves by better managing the land. And we can work with uh, federal agencies, uh, federal departments around land use, water use. Uh, we can certainly encourage uh, the federal government to do more on transport and energy and industry. And uh, the other player that we probably haven't talked a lot about is the private sector. Uh, mm -hmm. The private sector now, in many cases, is embracing renewables, it's embracing sustainability, partly because it's, there's money to be made, it's efficient. Uh, and it's also sustainable because the current very uh, huge reliance on fossil fuels is not sustainable. It's not consistent with a safe climate. And we're already seeing in many countries, uh, not only is coal fired generation reducing, but coal companies are going broke. They're going out of business because it's not a long-term viable business to be selling and burning coal. So it makes sense for the private sector to transition to this new uh, low carbon economy and working with the private sector, working with investors and banks, superannuation funds to achieve that is very much part of the solution. Absolutely. And um, to my next question as well, I was going to ask that, you know, given the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals can be perceived as an internationally broad framework, what role can Australia play in actioning SDGs on a domestic level? And I know that it's really interesting that you've just touched on the private sector as well, because that's a fantastic way that um, I think that we can definitely do things on a domestic level, but I'd love to hear what, what you really think that would be a really effective way of doing so. The Sustainable Development Goals are a globally agreed set of goals for where we want to be by the year 2030. And it's important that, to note that Australia signed up to the goals. The 
the, the Australian government, the current government. And so they are, if you like, a roadmap for us to use. And that's partly for the federal government to use, but also for state governments, local governments, companies, and indeed all of us in our own lives. And what's great about the goals is that they do set a target for us. They set a target of reducing poverty or ending poverty. They set a target of a sustainable environment and a fair society. And these are the sort of things everyone wants. And particularly as we're having to cope with the COVID pandemic and hopefully then to have an economic recovery from that, it makes sense that when we do that, at the same time, we seek to achieve these targets that we've set ourselves, which are all about making a better society, a better place for people to live. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. All right. So Nick, to my next question then. So um, often we see a range of information available to reduce our individual carbon footprint and consumption. However, considering the largest polluters are actually, you know, transnational corporations, do you think that the responsibility lies on governments to impose adequate sanctions as part of a large step in achieving UN sustainable development goals like climate action? Well, it's a joint responsibility because uh, when you say the largest polluters are transnational companies, in one sense is that's true, but the pollution is being caused by the products that they're producing, which we all use. Yeah. Uh, so you know, energy, electricity is a good example. The cars we drive, transport, uh, the fuel that we use to power our cars. So. Uh, yes, it's true that the companies are producing those, but we're using them. So it is a joint responsibility. Where things break down, though, is that a lot of the companies that are making money and have made money out of fossil fuels are using their lobbying power to entrench their business model, uh, despite the fact that it's dangerous for the planet and it's dangerous for our health. Uh, what we as citizens need to do is to be not consuming those fuels, to use alternatives, but also to be advocating for government to take action to support this big transition we need to a net zero economy. So it is a shared responsibility. I don't think it's good enough just to blame some and, and say it's someone else, it's not our, our responsibility. We all have a role to play. Yeah. Absolutely. And given that in the current society, a lot of us are reliant on these transnational corporations, consumption, sort of, you know, the centre of our society, what, what can we better do to, obviously you touched on, you know, um, a lot of these multinationals and things uh, sort of reverting to um, better energy sources and, you know, better um, consumption, but what can we do on an individual level to, you know, whilst uh, making sure that, you know, the economy is like still running, but ensuring that we're able to live a sustainability, um, sustainable life as individuals? There's lots of things we can do. Uh, you know, obviously, one thing is to have a smaller eco footprint in our own family life, and that means using less energy and uh, traveling in different ways, uh, doing what we can do as householders, as homes. But also, I think as citizens, we have a role to strongly stand up for the environment and for a safe climate. And that means through the people we vote for, it means through what we say publicly, it can mean uh, joining with others in the community who are advocating for a clean and green uh, society. So there's a lot we can do. I think the worst thing is for people just to throw up their hands and say, well, it's someone else's problem nothing I can do about it. In fact, we can all make a difference. Yeah, wonderful. And um, you touched on it uh, earlier today in terms of, you know, the COVID environment, how the pandemic's changing a lot of the way we live our lives, you know, even at the moment where we're sort of talking on Zoom rather than, you know, face to face. Um, so COVID has impacted the international community in a very clearly tremendous way. Um, when you observe high rates of, you know, job losses, disproportionate impacts on women and domestic violence and urgent health risks, both on our physical and mental health, do you think that we will be able to reach our 2030 targets of the UN system? sustainable development goals when the positive work um, seems, to, seems to be reversing because of the unprecedented crisis? Well, I think 
Unfortunately, uh, you point to a real challenge that the COVID pandemic is already having a negative impact on our ability to achieve the, the goals. Uh, it's certainly meaning that there's more poverty around the world and that's likely to get worse. It's having a really negative effect on people's health, not only directly, but the risk is as people uh, are concerned about the safety of hospitals and doctors that they're not gonna to go to the doctor for other conditions. Uh, we're seeing uh, evidence that some uh, families that don't have maybe access to the internet aren't gonna be able to uh, do homeschooling or get an education properly. Uh, women, as you say, are uh, potentially the, the big losers because they're in a lot of jobs that are being lost, a lot in the service industry. Uh, and so there's a big impact there and also domestic violence. And I guess finally, uh, inequality, which is what we're seeking to tackle with the goals and the whole principle of leave no one behind is fundamental to the sustainable development goals. That unfortunately is uh, inequality is being exacerbated by the pandemic. Uh, people you know, like ourselves who have homes and can isolate are much safer than people that uh, don't have good housing. So uh, yes, I think there's, there's real challenges. It's gonna make it much harder. The positive is that I think this whole pandemic is forcing us to slow down and reflect on our lifestyles and also reflect on where society is going. It does lead to a disruption point and it's when there's a disruption that major change is made. So I do believe that um, this is a time, a disruptive point in history where we could make some major changes that would put us on a more sustainable path. But we have to do it understanding that the, the pandemic is a huge challenge, which is hitting people unequally in all parts of the world. Yeah, absolutely. And that sort of wraps up all my questions for today. So thank you I so much for coming on board and agreeing to answer these questions as someone, you know, who's an expert and someone who's done tremendous work in sustainability, especially um, within the UN Sustainable Development Goals, but also in terms of government policy. So thank you so much for coming and um, we'll hope, I hope to speak to you soon. Okay, thanks, Rusty.